Suspense. Tonight, bring you Mr. Hume Cronin in Make Mad the Guilty, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment. Now, bring you Hume Cronin in a remarkable tale of Suspense. Bert. Bert. Yes, my dear. Well, have you found anything? I'm looking, my dear. On the theatrical page, I suppose. Of course, my dear. Looking. You've been doing that kind of looking for six months. Give me that paper. Bet I'll find your job in about six minutes. Yes, my dear. It is true that the theatrical season, particularly in San Francisco, particularly for Shakespearean actors, was inclined to be sluggish. And it is true that I had never had the great leading roles. Hamlet, Othello, Lear. Although my success in supporting parts amongst amateur groups had been little short of dazzling. It is also true that these successes were of some 15 seasons past. Still, the talent of your true artist is not to be thwarted or denied. But this was a matter which I had never properly succeeded in demonstrating to my wife, Elizabeth. Until at last, perforce, I was persuaded that the poor creature's life was dominated by only the most mercenary considerations. Face it, little man. You were washed up as an actor before you started. You've just been looking in the wrong part of this paper. Merciful heavens, desist! Have I not, in deference to your penurious concern, found you a boarder? Young Longstreet? <laughs> Him. A sublime specimen of lusty manhood. Don't try to change the subject. Yes, my dear. Oh, hey, here's something. Listen to this. Yes, my dear. A man with personality, poise, presence to appear before the public must be able to dress and act the part of impeccable good taste. What do you think of that? Why, sounds most promising. All right, little man, the job is practically yours. Uh, what is the nature of the position? Floor walker at Burdock's department store. Floor walker? My dear, that's Listen. impossible. Listen... I'm through supporting you as of today, understand? Yes, my dear, but then... And you'll take the job and like it. Yes, my dear. With deep misgivings, I accepted the position. Nevertheless, I carried my role with dignity, undismayed by the tittering clerks who found in my wing collar a curious novelty. Months passed... Uncomplainingly, I bore the yoke of my disgrace. But the strain of long hours began to tax my strength. One day I was feeling particularly unwell. I left the store early and picked up my car in the parking lot. My only thought was to reach the haven of our modest residence on the opposite side of San Francisco Bay, but even driving was an effort. I, I was faint by the time I reached the checking station on the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge. Hi, Mr. Matthews. Hey, you're early today. Hey, what's the matter? You look kind of... It's uh, my head again. Probably migraine. Ah, oh, here's your change. You know, you ought to take better care of yourself, Mr. Matthews. Now, if I was yes, you... Yes, I'll, I'll be all right. Diet's the thing, Mr. Matthews. Now, they say if you eat more... As I drove slowly across the great high span of the bridge and on through the Marin County hills, I knew, by some sixth sense, perhaps... This would be the day. The discovery. Elizabeth, my wife, and our boarder, young Longstreet. A broad-shouldered athletic nitwit. A swimming beach idol. I was returning early, you understand, and unexpectedly. Cautiously, I avoided the flagstone walk. On the soft lawn, my footsteps were noiseless. Quietly, I crossed the porch. I threw open the door. Sure enough. Suitcases packed for flight stood ready on the floor. Bert, you... Now, Mr. Matthews, Oh, I... shame. Oh, despair. Oh, nuts. Don't look so shocked. What did you expect? This is my burden of grief, my cross to bear. Oh, shame. Where is thy blush? Come down off your high horse, Bert. You wanted to get rid of me, didn't you? Well, I'm leaving. If you don't like it, you know what you can do. In silence, I have suffered your petty deceptions, your taunts, your gross vulgarities... But now, at long last, the worm turns. Bert, put down that gun. Hey, hold on a minute, Mr. Matthews. I'm My heart have... has turned to stone. Bert, you're ridiculous. Don't make me laugh. Ridiculous? 
On the contrary, my dear wife, I am, for the first time in 15 years, a man. Now listen, Mr. Matthews. Look at him, always the tragic actor, the great tragedian. You're positively silly with that revolver trembling in your hand. Give it to me. Keep your distance. I warn you. Now look here, Mr. Matthews. Betty and I have got... Don't worry, handsome. The little man won't shoot. I know him too well. Now give me that gun. I warned you. I said give me that gun. Oh, that you had 40,000 lives. One is too poor, too weak for my revenge. Hey! Hit him, handsome. Well, we're on our way. Bring the suitcases, handsome. Shall I hit him again, Betty? Oh, the little man won't bother us anymore. Oh, just one. For luck, huh? Oh, suit yourself. Yeah. To remember me. Bye. No. <laughs> Be seeing you, little man. Wait. So long, Matthews. Don't take any wooden nickels, Elizabeth. huh? Elizabeth, wait. What for? We've got places to go. Please, Elizabeth. I... I, I, I am the vanquished. It is I who must go. Pride compels it. I shall go far away, disappear, vanish from your life forever. He's nuts. Quiet. What's this you're trying to say, Bert? You're offering to disappear? Vanish, Scrap? Precisely. Put down the suitcases, Hansen. The little man has something up his sleeve. Sit on a floor, worm. And remember, we haven't got all day to talk. Please, please understand, dear wife. In my disappearance, in my seeming death, if you will, there are certain advantages to be derived for all concerned. I'm listening. My life insurance policy, for instance. Twenty thousand dollars. Not an inconsiderable sum. Say, I'd forgotten about that. Yes, but softly, dear wife, softly, let me finish. I was thinking rather of other advantages you would derive. My sudden death, presumptive of course, would give you freedom to marry your healthy milkweed, this handsome non-entity. Hey, hey, watch yourself, Matthews. I don't like that stuff. Uh, my deepest apologies, handsome. Oh. Uh, now, Elizabeth, to the subject of the insurance. Even in my far-off oblivion, I'll have need of money. I thought perhaps you would collect the money and... And what? Forward it to me. Oh, so that's it. <laughs> You're not the fool I thought you were. There are mutual advantages, as I have indicated. I would have the $20,000, a trifling reward for my sacrifice. You would have a well-furnished home and uh, handsome. Maybe you've got something. Let me think it over. I don't get it at all. You will, handsome. You will. Elizabeth agreed, as I knew she would. She was, in fact, delighted. Longstreet gave us brief pause, but in the end, my charming wife persuaded him. Due to early training in the theater, the strategy of my demise was masterful. After three days' rehearsal with my two accomplices, I drove to the checking station of the Golden Gate Bridge. I was careful to enter the gate na- manned by my acquaintance. Ah, how are you feeling today, Mr. Man? I was... protest, sir, with emphatic emphasis. Ah, I don't get you. This toll levy upon the use of a public thoroughfare by my conscience, it's unsocial, immoral, a downright swindle. Hey, 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 what's got into you? Come on, pay your fare. I know you not, magpie. Huh? Are you carrion? Who, me? Are you fowl, flesh or fish? Here, vulture, your pound of flesh. Hey, look, Mr. Matthews, hey, you better see a doctor. Doctor, indeed. But the fellow would remember me. I drove slowly, watching in the rear view mirror. Near the center of the great bridge, high above the foaming sea, Longstreet and Elizabeth pulled in behind me. A break came in the traffic. I signaled Longstreet. He pulled his car alongside mine. Quickly, I leaped to his car, leaving mine abandoned at the very center of the bridge. The abandoned car, the suicide note I'd left on the seat, would bear mute testimony to my tragic fate. And by my conscience, the word of the fellow at the checking station would tip the scales. There remained but to vanish from the eyes of all who'd known me, and my desperate deed was done. Elizabeth and Longstreet drove me to Sacramento. I boarded the train for Mexico. The frail, meek little floor walker was no more. I was dead. Gone. Kaput. Presumptive death, indeed. In truth, I was reborn. And on some not too distant tomorrow, I would return, and the lives of Elizabeth and Handsome would be forfeit. (laughs) 
For Suspense, are bringing you Hume Cronin in Make Mad the Guilty. Presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense... And now, bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Hume Cronin in Make Mad the Guilty. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Yes, the frail and meek little floor walker was no more. In Mexico, a new man wore my shoes. I became a man of purpose and daring. Through the art of makeup and disguise, I gave myself a villainous and frightful appearance, corresponding to my new character. I returned boldly to San Francisco with no fear of recognition. Thus was I privileged to read in the local papers of my own suicide and later of my wife's marriage to young Longstreet. Weeks passed. I learned Elizabeth had received the insurance money. I was well aware, of course, that she had no intention of giving me any part of it. The moment of final settlement had arrived. Late at night, as befits one returning from the grave, I rang the bell at the cottage I once called home. Oh. It is I, your lately deceased husband. Bert, you... Handsome! May the dead enter with the quick. Uh, permit me to force my entry. Oh. Handsome! On my word, you're frightened. Well, that ridiculous makeup you have on. Why do you have to go around like a scarecrow frightening people? Hey, what goes on here? Hurry, Bert's here. Ah, handsome. In nightshirt and armed with a kitchen knife. An heroic figure, to be sure. Matthews. Gosh, your face... The face of Lazarus, risen from the dead, transformed by the chemistry of death. Don't be funny, Bert. What do you want? The insurance money. Twenty thousand dollars. Are you surprised? Oh, you had more to come back, Matthews. A bargain is a bargain. Here's all the money I have in the house. Take it. Now, will you go? May I repeat, a bargain is a bargain. Oh, stand there, stupid. What are you waiting for? Well, what do you want me to do, Benny? Y- you shall I... Uh... The knife gleams in the hand of the shirt tail killer. Hit him, handsome. Now, Matthews, I mean I... Ah. Ah, you've observed this automatic in my hand. Also observe as I remove the safety catch. I see your face grows pale. Now, wait a minute, Bert. What do you want? Dear me, hadn't I made that clear? I thought I had. I want my $20,000. Now, listen, Matthews, take it easy. We only collected it yesterday. Precisely. Hence my timely arrival this evening. Well? Bert, I can't give it to you. Tonight, I mean, I haven't got it. You forget, my dear, that I have lived with you in apparent connubial bliss for nearly 15 years. I know your habits all too well. I would venture to say that not only have you the money in cash, but that I know where you've hidden it. Oh, no, no. I know she didn't do that. No? And what is this? Oh, you did. Why, you... I could have told you that she wasn't to be trusted. Dear me, you have so much to learn, handsome. And so little time to learn. No, no, Matthews, wait. Wait! Bert! Bert, you killed him! Not I, dear wife. I, as you remember, have no existence. I am dead. But you... Bert! Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Would I could stay to see you explain this whole thing to the police when it be morrow? Perhaps you see it now, eh? Perhaps now you fully understand the sweep and majesty and genius of it. Or you must know I had planned it. Yes, planned it every step of the way from the day I introduced Elizabeth to Longstreet until the poor wretch was found hovering over his corpse. Had ever a man played and conceived so magnificent a role, and in no tawdry theater for the make-believe, but in the vast arena of life itself, there was but one thing lacking. That one ingredient so essential to the full savoring by the artist of his creative genius. An audience. And even that I had foreseen. I had my audience ready-made. Elizabeth. Elizabeth should be my audience. Her frantic protestations of innocence, her unbelieved cries and lamentations that the ingenuity of my plot would be meat and drink and the very breath of life to me. (laughs) 
by a slight alteration of my appearance, I was able to attend her trial. Like a spectator at my own play, I could not have directed the performance better and myself. Then, then this remarkable woman, with the murder weapon still uh, figuratively reeking in her hand, has the temerity to tell this court and this jury that the crime was committed by a former husband who conveniently rose from the dead and then disappeared once more into limbo. <laughs> no, no, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. She is guilty. And the state asks that you find her guilty. With full knowledge and consent to the penalty with which that guilt entails. The penalty of death. No, 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 he's alive. He's alive. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. I'll find you the defendant, Elizabeth Longstreet. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. <laughs> Dispatch this wire, please. All right. Uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Longstreet, death row. Oh. Uh, you can deliver it, can you not? Oh, sure, sure. Um... Uh... You have a rendezvous with death. From the depth of experience, can assure you he is by no means an unfriendly companion. Unfriendly? Oh, unfriendly companion. Heartfelt sympathy, courage. Courage. Uh, 39 words. Let's see, that'll be 78 cents. Out of the dollar. Thank you. Really is sad when you come to think of it. I guess you were a friend of hers, huh? Hmm? Oh, in a sense, to be sure. <laughs> yes, in a sense. Oh, wait a minute. You didn't sign it. Just sign it, little man. The next day, I eagerly scanned the papers for the outburst that this sensational communication must certainly cause. But there was nothing. So I sent a letter, something a little more direct. I scanned the press anew. But still no sign. No single word to tell me how she had received it. What was it? A conspiracy of silence? I was like a player performing to a cold and empty house. Clearly, some stronger medicine was needed. Yes, sir? Ah, lilies. The symbol of purity and death. They are lovely, aren't they? Fresh cut this morning, Sweet too. poetry of flowers. A most delicate yet firm reminder of my unwavering concern. Do you wish to make a purchase, sir? Oh, or... decidedly. Give me all you have. I wish them sent by special messenger. The season is propitious. Yes, sir. <laughs> Where uh, to, sir? To Mrs. Elizabeth Longstreet. To Hatchapi Prison. The Death House. Mrs. Elizabeth. <gasps> and would you mind writing a card? As you can see, my right hand has suffered a slight injury. Very well, sir. Uh, what do you wish me to write? Uh, just say, from the little man who wasn't there. And sign it, Bert. My own name, you see. That surely would bring results. But no, nothing. Once again, nothing. I saw it now. She was playing with me, deliberately playing with me, concealing my communications from her jailers. And my time was running out. The execution was within the week. But I would move her. I'd move her in such wise that she would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech. Make mad the guilty. Okay, next. Uh, it's my understanding that the state law requires the presence of witnesses to a prison execution. I therefore request... Okay, who do you want to see go? Mrs. Elizabeth Longstreet. Uh, let me see. That's uh, Friday morning. What's your name? Uh, Bertram Mason. Uh -huh. Let me see some identification. Driver license, anything you got. Identification? Yeah, yeah, anything, anything at all. Well, you see, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry, bud. We've got to know who we invite to these parties some other time. Well, hold on, sir. I demand... I that said I... some other time. Now, beat it. You hear me? She was slipping from my grasp, don't you see? The curtain was already beginning to descend. And still, there was no audience to hear my curtain lines. That night, I paced the streets in a torment of indecision. Then, as dawn was breaking, I realized what I must do. A drastic, desperate measure... But I must take it. The execution was the following morning, and at the earliest moment, I presented myself at the prison gate. 
Yeah? What can I do for you? It's imperative, absolutely imperative, that I be present at the execution of Elizabeth Longstreet. I'm sorry, mister. Now, wait. You don't understand. Uh, Can't be done. Oh, if you as a relative say... That's it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I am. I am related. Yeah? Well, that might be different. How are you related to her? I am her husband. Her husband? Oh. Now, don't try to get funny, mister. It just so happens she murdered her husband. No, no, not him. Her former husband. The man whose name was mentioned so often at the trial. They thought I was dead, but I'm not. I, I'm Bert Matthews. Oh, a crackpot. Huh? Save it for a soapbox, brother. Now, now, wait. I can prove it. She will recognize Sure, sure, me. I know. Now, run along. I implore you. I, I beg you, call the warden. Tell him that there's a man here. What was that? Yeah. Not now she won't recognize you. What do you mean? I mean, that's it. It's all over. Finished. Oh, no. No. Not dead. That's right, brother. He's dead. Suddenly my life was empty. And all my plans of triumph were as ashes in my mouth. Hers had been the triumph, not mine. Hers the tragic spectacle. Hers the hour upon the stage. Now in truth was I really dead. For who now would applaud my artistry? Who would believe my tale or even recognize my face? Only tragedy and death gain recognition. Yes. And therein was my answer. Therein at last would I breach the portals of undying fame, leaving behind me a manuscript setting forth the facts in full detail. I would actually die. The first man in history to die and come to life and die again since Lazarus. I searched the streets until I found a car with the keys and the ignition lock. I stole it. I drove to the Golden Gate Bridge, for I would not only die twice, I would die twice in the same place and the same way. I drove past the gateman and on. Hey, wait! On to the very highest part of the parapet. I would stand while horrified onlookers gazed helplessly. Then, as eager hands reached out to save my life, I would leap. I was dimly conscious of the siren behind me. But paid no heed, I drove faster, faster to my splendid doom. Suddenly I heard a shot, then another. My car was out of control, swerving, lurching, swerving like a crazy thing. I think for a moment I lost consciousness. And when next I knew what I was doing, I had crawled from the wreckage and was staggering towards the railing of the bridge. And I was being pursued. Even now, at this late hour, some monstrous fate seemed bent on thwarting my design. Stop! 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 We'll shoot! No, no, they would not stop me. I would not be thwarted. I staggered on. Searing pain in my shoulder. I fell. I struggled to my feet again. The railing was almost within my grasp. The shot, that rending, tearing agony of the bullet through my chest. I was on my knees again, but I must, I must. I clawed at the steel railing painfully, painfully lifting myself up for a moment. I balanced, swaying, and then oblivion. I heard their voices coming to me from a long way off, like voices of the dead. Stand back, stand back, stand back. What? This guy's playing for heaven. This ain't license number. I wonder why he ran. Yeah, it's tough, and he looks like such a honest little guy. Please. Please, is there no one to believe me? Just one. The lowliest of men, the tiniest of lisping children. Just one. Before this stage is dark. Before I shuffle off this mortal coil. Before I die. Suspense.
This is Hume Cronin. It's been a great pleasure appearing for you on Suspense. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Tonight's Suspense play was by Irving Moore and Robert Richards from an original story by Robert Rawson. Next Thursday, same time, Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear. 